Okay, today's lesson is going to be on Newton's second and third laws of motion. Newton's second law of motion. When a net external force acts on an object of mass m, the acceleration that results is directly proportional to the net force and has a magnitude that is inversely proportional to the mass. The direction of the acceleration is the same as the direction of the net force. In other words, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. All right, so we've had Newton's first law. I just explained what Newton's second law is. But you may be asking yourself is, I don't know when I'm supposed to use which law. Well, it's pretty simple. If all the forces balance out, in other words, all of them add up to zero, use Newton's first law because all the forces add to zero. And this would be very similar to our, like our vector addition lab we've done. If on the other hand, the forces end up being unbalanced, in other words, there's a net force in one of the directions, and that all depends on your coordinate system, then the object accelerates. And if it accelerates, use net Newton's second law. So it's really simple. Okay. So let's talk about the units for um, force. The sum of the force is equal to mass times acceleration. So let's put in units here. Okay, well we know it's a Newton, but why is it a Newton? And here's the reason why. Mass is measured in kilograms. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. You multiply those two together, you get a kilogram meter per second squared. And that's what a Newton is. But you may be saying to yourself, what is actually a Newton? To give you an idea that if you have one pound, it's about 4.4 4. 4 newtons. Um, and one newton is about a quarter of a pound. And here's some units for mass, acceleration, and force um, in other than the SI units. Uh, for example, we have kilograms of mass in the SI. Acceleration is meters per second squared. And the overall unit for force is newtons. Um, the British engineering system, you would have masses measured in, believe it or not, called slugs. The acceleration is in feet per second squared, and the force ends up being in pounds. Okay. All right, so a lot of times we might do problems and we need to draw what's called a free body diagram. And free body diagram is just a simple way of drawing a diagram that makes the problem easier to solve. Um, and instead of drawing like two people pushing a car and like I guess maybe friction pushing back and, and the car itself, we could summarize this really simply with a free body diagram. Hey, make the dot, the car dot or square or something, and then you just show the two forces acting on it. Makes it a lot simpler to see and understand and draw. Um, when we talk about forces in free body diagrams, we don't really care what caused the force. For example, imagine a box right now on your, your desk. The box pushes down on the table, and this is the weight of the box. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But So the box is pushing down on the table. And obviously, the table has to push back up on the box. This is called a normal force. And once again, we'll talk more about this later. You don't really care about the reaction forces beyond your object. For example, the table pushes on the box. Good, because it's dealing with the box and the table. The table pushes on the floor. Who cares? It has nothing to do with your problem. So you only really want to show the interactions acting on your particular object. That's why it's called a free body diagram. And you also may want to show the accelerations and the velocities and the mass on your, on your diagram, but they're really not forces, so you shouldn't draw them attached to it. You should draw it next to it. If you drew it, drew it on it, you may get confused and think that's a force. Okay, so why do we use them in the first place? To see what's happening in the object and to make the problem simpler. Um, and speaking of making problems simpler, we can actually take our normal x, y axes and rotate it to make a problem simpler. For example, Let's say a box is on a ramp. Um, instead of having a horizontal x and a vertical y, 
we could take that whole axis and rotate it in the direction of the ramp so that makes the problem simpler. Okay, so let's go back to our free body diagram of the car. Okay, what's the net force in this case? Well, you simply add all the forces, taking into account the positive direction. I assume we're calling to the right positive. So the 275 and the 395 newtons are positive, and the 560 is negative. So you have a net force of 110 newtons, and that's acting towards the right in our coordinate system. Okay. And if we know the mass of the car, then we can actually use our equation of Newton's second law to figure out its acceleration because we know that acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces, which we just calculated, divided by the mass. And therefore, we get the acceleration of the car. And you can see the acceleration is pretty low. Um, it's less than a meter per second squared. Now, since forces and accelerations are vectors, we can actually break both the accelerations and the forces into their vector components. Um, for example, we could take the sum of the forces equal mass times acceleration is really equivalent to the sum of the force of the y is equal to mass times acceleration of the y, and sum of the force of the x is equal to mass times acceleration of the x. By the way, notice mass doesn't have an x or a y because it's just a scalar. Okay, here's an example of that. You have a three kilogram, excuse me, a thirteen hundred kilogram raft. There it is. It's paddled due east across a still pond with a force of 17 newtons. The wind pushed the raft with a force of 15 newtons at an angle of 67 degrees north of east. What are the vector components of the acceleration? All right, so here's the original diagram we have right here. 17 newtons due east, and then we have a vector of 15 newtons at an angle of 67 degrees north of east. We'd have to take this vector and break it into its components as you can see here. Then we have to add them all together. Um, so here we go. Here is the component of 17 newtons in the x, and it has no y component. And then we took the, uh, the air acting on the raft, one component acting to the north, and one component acting to the east. And then we could add up all the x's and all the y's and come up with an answer. So with that in mind, we can then figure out what the acceleration is in each direction. This would be 22 newtons, or excuse me, 23 newtons in the x direction div divided by the mass of the raft, and this would give us the acceleration of the x. And we could do the same thing in the y direction. Now, obviously, you can add the vector components of the accelerations and find the net acceleration if you wish. Um, so in other words, it has an acceleration in the x and the y. We can use our sine and, uh, or excuse me, our Pythagorean theorem and figure out the net acceleration um, and use the arc tangent or inverse tangent to figure out the direction, which we've done in, in previous lectures. Okay. Newton's third law. Whenever one body exerts a force on the second body, the second body exerts an opposite directed force of equal magnitude on the first body. This is sometimes called the action-reaction law. So what is an action-reaction pair? Um, a pair of equal but opposite forces resulted from the interaction of two objects. Say what? Let's try to make it simpler. Forces do not cancel each other out when they're action-reaction pairs. The reason is they act on different objects. For example, A pushes B. Therefore, B pushes A. In other words, right now, you're sitting on a chair, I'd imagine. You're pushing down on the chair. At the same time, the chair is pushing up on you, equal and opposite. If they weren't equal, you would accelerate. It would be quite un comfortable and funny, I imagine, is if the two didn't match. Okay. Um, 
Here's another example. Um, they have to be equal in magnitude. Think of it this way. You do not break your hand when you punch a wall. You could punch a wall as hard as you want and you won't break your hand. You only break your hand if the wall is able to punch you back. Um, you're thinking, well, what's the difference? Think of it this way. You really can't hit something hard unless it can hit you hard. Um, try hitting a piece of paper. Hold a piece of paper in your left hand and punch it with your right hand. It can't hit back hard, so you can't hit it hard. Okay? Here's an example of Newton's third law. You have an astronaut pushing um, a spacecraft. He pushes forward with a push of P, and the rocket has to push back with a push of negative P. Newton's third law. A pushes B, B pushes A. And suppose the magnitude of the force is 36 newtons, and the, the uh, spacecraft has a mass of 11,000 kilograms, and the astronaut is 92 kilograms. What are the resultant accelerations? Now the forces are equal, but it does not mean the accelerations will be equal, as you can see using Newton's second law. So the two forces are equal and opposite, so we use Newton's second law and find out the acceleration of the spacecraft. You would have a push of 36 newtons divided by 11,000 kilograms. It comes out to be an acceleration of 0 0.0033 meters per second squared. Well, same push on the astronaut opposite in direction because if the astronaut pushes it to the right, the spacecraft to the right, the spacecraft have to push the astronaut to the left, so one's positive, one's negative. You can see that the um, acceleration is much higher, and that's due to the fact that same same force, much less mass.